G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for another trade update as we uh, approach the end of a interesting trade period and uh, I think this all ends on Wednesday, which means that a lot of deals are starting to uh, be pushed short for time at the moment um, and it was another day where we got a few deals, I think there was three deals uh, finalised today and uh, we're still building up for uh, a pretty tense climax, gross, that was a gross phrase. So in today's video, we're going to give a little rundown of uh, what actually took place today and add a little bit of uh, detail and update to a few of the deals that uh, are probably going to be pushed all the way, to be honest. And what I mean by that is probably be deadline day deals. We've seen in the past where the, the AFL just stop announcing uh, trade updates on the final day to build up for an exciting last hour. So we're probably going to see that again. And uh, yeah, anyway, we're going to get into what happened today. And before I do that, I just want to thank everyone who has recently jumped onto the channel and subscribed recently. Um, I set that audacious goal of getting to 23 3,000 subscribers by the trade deadline day. We're now about 48 hours from that, and uh, I think I just need 50 more subscribers. So thank you so much. We're closer than I really expected, but if we can get to 23K, that'd be amazing. As well, guys, for, for extra content, obviously I've been doing these trade updates every day. Um, uh, yesterday, I did a sort of predictions for week two of the trade period, so you can see what deals are still uh, yet to come. And of course, I did a summary on Saturday morning, every trade from week one of the trade period already. So there's your summary content, and today we're gonna get into to what happened today. So the first one that took place was Liam Henry finally joined the St. Kilda Footy Club. We knew this one was going to happen for a little while. And uh, interestingly, you know, I think I said in my predictions video that we kind of expected this one to be contingent on them getting their Jade Gresham compensation. So that would seem to be what was delaying this particular deal. But interestingly, the, uh, the, the deal that's been offered to Fremantle and subsequently accepted had nothing to do with uh, the Jade Gresham comp compensation. It's funny, in my predictions video, I, uh, I said that the Gresham compo I would go to uh, Fremantle and that would have been pick 23, I think, in this year's draft. Funnily enough, Drewsy messaged me last night saying there's absolutely no way that Fremantle would accept that. Funnily enough, what they have accept is actually worse. So the details of the trade are that St Kilda have offered uh, Fremantle their future second round pick and their future fourth round pick for Liam Henry and uh, and a future fourth round pick going from Fremantle to St Kilda. So they swap future fourths and a future second round pick, which is probably going to be in the late 20s, early 30s next year after Academy you know bids and stuff that happen next year as well, which obviously is an inferior deal to pick 23. So uh, suck on that jersey, first of all. But in all seriousness, um, you know, Liam Henry wilds a top 10 pick three years ago. And of course, you know, it, the further you get away from a player's draft, the less his draft position means. So after three years, it doesn't really matter that he was a top 10 pick. It holds a little bit of weight. And we know that Liam Henry had a pretty decent season and certainly a, a breakout year by his own standards. Looking at it on the whole, though, I think uh, Liam Henry has enough promise that I think St. Kilda has actually done pretty well out of this deal. A future second round pick uh, to pick up a prospect of Liam Henry's ability and stature in the second round of a draft or in like mid to late second round of the draft, I think in terms of probability, St. Kilda probably did better getting Liam Henry than using that draft pick. So on that basis, uh, a good piece of business for them. I think Fremantle has accepted a slightly light deal, but at the end of the day, um, their strategy really is going to be looking at next year's draft as we'll get into when we talk about the Schultz deal as well. So they're, they're loading up for picks in the future. St. Kilda were never going to offer a future first round pick for Liam Henry. So this is probably the best deal in their eyes that they could get. Obviously not placing too much emphasis on this year's draft. So second to that as well, Lockie Schultz also joined Collingwood. So the two uh, two of the three departures today were both from the Fremantle Footy Club. Schultz uh, was contracted obviously for next season, with um, but he was going to be a unrestricted free agent next year as well because he has been previously delisted. So Fremantle decided to deal him this year, uh, even though they technically didn't have to. They received two draft picks for this. They got pick 34 in this year's draft and Collingwood's future first round pick. So I think we said already in a previous video that the benefit of a future first round pick is twofold. First of all, uh, you know, there's talk of them potentially having targets uh, for next year, which we'll talk about in one second. But it's also tied to Collingwood's ladder position next year, which means that if Collingwood don't win the premiership, that means that automatically that draft pick is going to improve on what this year's draft pick would be. Now, there is a chance Collingwood go back to back for sure, but there's also a reasonable chance that they don't. In fact, probably more than 50-50, you'd say. I don't even know what the probability would be, but it's, it's unlikely. So the more likely than not, Fremantle have gotten a better pick than uh, pick 19 in this year's draft or whatever it is. So to summarize the, the ingoings and outgoings, uh, Fremantle now 
have picks 34, 46, 60, and 64. So losing two players in this year's draft, they've shown an unwillingness to really trade into the first round of this year's draft, which probably shows a, uh, a lack of faith in it. Um, but of course, the, the draft hand for next year is really, really strong. So if the 2024 ladder finished exactly the way 2023 did, which is obviously is never going to happen, but if it did, hypothetically, Fremantle would have picks 5, 14, 18, and 32 next year. So four picks in the top 32 and three first round picks. The two picks obviously tied to Port Adelaide, first of all, and then Collingwood, and then a second rounder tied to St. Kilda as well as their own second rounder. Sorry, they don't have their own second rounder next year. They did trade that to Port Adelaide. So it's, it is only St. Kilda's future second round pick there. So obviously the logic of this is, you know, as it's been suggested by myself and others, are they loading up for a potential trade next year for someone like a Ugal Hagen, someone like a Logan McDonald? The Logan McDonald one makes sense because hey, they need a key forward to, to partner. Jai Amos, but also he's West Australian. But it could be simpler than that because if, if, first of all, they could just rate the talent in next year's draft higher. But secondly, what we're going to see next year is another case of clubs with academy bids and father-son bids happening in the first round. So we know about Levi Ashcroft to um, the Brisbane Lions. That's likely to be in the top 10 or so at this stage. It's too early to plot. you got Tyler Welsh, who at the moment is considered a top three prospect. He's a father-son for Adelaide as a key forward prospect. There is at least one Sydney Academy player. There's a couple of Camprioli boys, I think. They're twins, if I'm not mistaken. They're Carlton father-sons. Not necessarily going to go early in next year's draft, but there's also a Gold Coast player who is top 10 uh, Lombard, I think his name is, in next year's draft. So what we're going to see is potentially the first round and potentially the top five compromised again. So what's going to happen here? Say the Brisbane Lions, say the Gold Coast Suns, say the Adelaide Crows, if they uh, have a pick in the first round, they're going to be willing to trade first round picks for you know later first round picks. So Obviously, the Brisbane Lions, you probably expect they're going to finish high up the ladder, but let's say the Adelaide Crows or the Gold Coast Suns, you know, finish in the bottom six. Again, not predicting that by any stretch, but Fremantle could then package, you know, what is now 14 and 18 next year for a top six pick or something like that. So there's going to be opportunities to trade into the early parts of next year's draft. So that's it from a Freo perspective. I think Lockie Schulz for Collingwood presents as a, uh, a really good move, to be honest. I think this guy is probably a little bit underrated outside of Western Australia. Uh, he is a really crafty sort of medium small forward there. And I think Collingwood has a new dynamic mix with him in the team. Obviously, Taylor Adams was playing a little bit of half forward last year. Um, you know, reduced midfield minutes. Shaws comes in as an actual specialist forward as a way of optimizing their best 22. It does probably push Ginevan out of the best 22, but from all reports, it seems like there's no real interest on either side for Ginevan to leave Collingwood. So I think Collingwood do improve their best 22 out of this deal. It's a really good move for them. Equally, St. Kilda, they're on the hunt for, you know, run and carry, particularly on the outside and also midfield reinforcements. Liam Henry provides value in both of those areas. So some mutually beneficial deals here and uh, keep an eye on Fremantle for next year. And to be honest, this year as well, they must be cooking something up. They don't just lose players and then not enter this draft and have no other ideas of improving their list in the short term. Just my personal take. The third formal move that got done today was a player called Bigoa Nguyen. And I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I've never seen this guy play. He's played one game for Richmond, uh, but he is a key defensive prospect who's uh, who's played for him for a couple of years now, or at least been on their list. And North Melbourne uh, reinforced their back line. Obviously, the, the way they've reinforced their key defensive stocks has been interesting. So on the one hand, you've got Ben Mackay, obviously, leaving the football club. And you've got Griffin Logue, another key defender who has done an ACL and is probably going to miss, I don't know, half of next year, probably. Their reinforcements are a delisted free agent in Toby Pink, who played in the AFL years ago, like four years ago, and then been playing for Glen Elks since, I believe. And Big Owen Yon, who has, uh, you know, only played one game at AFL level. So uh, it's nice to see them trying to plug holes in their list. But in terms of quality, whatever you think of Ben Mackay or Griffin Logue, this uh, this is a, a speculative one at best, to be honest. So, But I'm not saying this move in isolation is a bad one. I don't know the kid. But what I will say is, on the whole, you know, Toby Pink and Big Neon have big shoes to fill to some extent, uh, trying to fit into their best 22. And I think it does maybe foreshadow as well North Melbourne going tall in this year's draft. Um, but even again, say it's Dan Curtin, say it's um, Connor Roy Sullivan, say it's, uh, what's the other guy, Ollie Murphy. If those guys get drafted in the first round, they're still going to be too raw to play AFL level. So I can see why they made this move, but maybe I would have made more of an effort to pick up an experienced defender. Maybe they try and get a Dougal Howard or a Tom Cleary out of uh, those clubs. Those are two players that were listed as being gettable by their respective clubs. So we'll see what happens there, but surely North Melbourne will do something in that space. Speaking of key 
defenders on the move. Uh, Harrison Petty, we, we already talked about this in the preview video where I said that I really don't think this will happen. It has now been categorically ruled out by um, Tim Lamb. That's the list manager, I think, for Melbourne. And he categorically said there's no deal that's going to be done. Um, it does kind of foreshadow a time in the future where Harrison Petty probably will uh, leave the footy club. Uh, I think he says his contract ends in two years and uh, he will be a free agent in that time. And if it's true what they say about Harrison Petty always wanting to get back to Adelaide at some point, Melbourne are probably looking at two years left of Harrison Petty, I would I would suggest. But with them being right in the thick of the premiership window, this probably is the best move for them to not you know throw out a key piece of their, their spine, obviously, um, just because he wants to. He's contracted, so they've held firm. So this, in my opinion, will speed up the Shane McAdam deal. Uh, if Adelaide have given up, this is time for them to probably accept that future second round pick for McAdam. The Brandon Zerk Thatcher deal is, uh, is is a bit of a ball ache. It looks like this one could run to deadline day. There has been the renewed threat of the preseason draft because he is out of contract and Port Adelaide would draft him in the preseason draft. The awkward situation they've got though is they now use that threat for Rasava Radaglia and Zerk Thatcher. So the preseason draft is only one round. So uh, what may happen hypothetically, right, is that Asava Radaglia could enter the national draft and get drafted by Port Adelaide at pick 25, which is what they were offering for him. Then they could get Zerk Thatcher in the uh, in the preseason draft or vice versa or whatever. But essentially what's happening with this deal is that Essendon are pretty reluctant to let him go. And the report is, while they are interested in Xavier Dersma, they only raised Xavier Dersma's name because of the fact that they're losing Zerk Thatcher. He's not a legitimate target for them in another circumstance. But Essendon may be looking at a straight swap and they won't necessarily want to give up more for, for Dersma coming in because again, this is Port Adelaide's initiated this deal, not Essendon. And if they don't offer anything else as a little bit of a sweetener, this will make it a little bit more painful to, for Port Adelaide to get their other deals done. So Port Adelaide will probably be looking at pick 30 of this deal and hoping it unlocks potentially a Saba Radagalia as well. In other Port Adelaide news as well, um, this is probably the strongest suggestion I've seen that uh, Ivan Soldo could end up at Port Adelaide. Now, this is a rumor that uh, I've been you know, circulating for a while and I have been talking about it on this channel, but according to Tom Morris on SEN, there is a renewed push to get Soldo to Port Adelaide. So this was, it was an interesting one where I, I thought it was weird that they were going for both Soldo and Sweet. Two Ruckman, two Ruckman at their respective clubs who want to be number one Ruck. Both going to potentially be at Port Adelaide. I think that uh, is a little bit curious. But uh, someone called Davies from Port Adelaide said that the power were open to acquiring both of them, which is an interesting one. That means to me that they see them both in their best 22. I really don't think Jordan Sweet would have requested a trade specifically to Port Adelaide unless he was given some indication he would get some pretty good game time there. He's not going to be a Bulldogs backup Ruck and then be happy happy being a Port Adelaide backup ruck, I wouldn't have thought unless there's family reasons for going home, which there is no suggestion of yet. But while there is a renewed push, it is also reported that Richmond are holding firm on this because they believe he is a required player. He's, I presume he's contracted as well, which makes him difficult, this difficult for Port Adelaide to get it done. And finally as well, uh, we, we probably have our firmest suggestion as well that the Gold Coast and Carlton will do a deal for Elijah Holland. And what I mean by that is this one was a, uh, a trade story that's been bubbling away for a little bit yet, but there, there hasn't been a huge push from other club to get this done, uh, but uh, Craig Cameron from the Gold Coast Suns came up with some interesting comments uh, where he made it sound like Gold Coast was kind of initiating this rather than Carlton seeking out Elijah Hollands or Elijah Hollands wanting to go home. So it says, while Hollands hasn't requested a trade to Carlton, he, and he's also said that he'd be happy to stay out of his contract, Cameron goes on to say, you know, talk about how they, they've played Hollands out of position. Um, they think he's more of a midfielder, but he's been pushed out to a wing, but the opportunity in the midfield is probably not going to come at the Gold Coast Suns. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. You know, they've got Raul Anderson and Miller in the guts there. Sam Flanders has certainly overtaken Hollands in the pecking order there, you'd think. He even named Alex Davies as someone they're probably going to prioritize as well. He doesn't say they're going to prioritize him, but he, if he names them, he's making an example of players that will make it tough for Elijah Hollands to break into that midfield. So he also goes on to talk about total player pavements, i.e. that is the salary cap, okay? So while he says that um, Hollands is not exorbitantly paid, he does say that they've had to make some really tough decisions on players uh, that are contracted. So from all the noise that I'm reading here, um, this is more likely Gold Coast looking to get this done than any other party involved. I think this is more likely to happen than it, it appeared maybe a few days ago. So uh, Elijah Hollands is probably going to join his brother, Ollie, uh, probably not on deadline day. I'd say this probably could happen tomorrow. If that's the case and, and Carlton are not pushing for this and Gold Coast are, then a future second round pick is actually starting to look a little bit generous for a guy who spent most of the year in the VFL this year. So while he's contracted, I reckon future second, potentially future third gets this done probably tomorrow. But again, who knows? 
Anyway, guys, that's just a little update on what happened today. Not a huge news day, but I thought it was still worth covering for you um, regardless. So in the background of all this, I'm still working on my next Phantom Draft. Um, so stay tuned for that and more draft content. Thinking of doing a little bit more regular draft content this year uh, and got some ideas for maybe really looking at individual players uh, particularly if they're rated in the first round or so. So as always, I appreciate your support. I uh, appreciate you watching the videos. I appreciate all those who have jumped on lately and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.